Well, thank you all for joining us today. My name is David Biggie, and I'm the co-chair of the International Courts and Tribunals Interest Group, which organized uh, this particular panel. Uh, I'd also like to upfront thank the sponsor for this panel, Curtis Belay. Um, our interest group, because we don't have a business meeting, uh, I just need to get a couple items of business out of the way. We are planning some exciting events for next fall. Uh, so keep a lookout uh, for notice about those events. We have also launched, uh, or we are going to launch our first newsletter. And so interest group members, uh, I hope you'll see an email in the next few weeks soliciting your contributions to that newsletter. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Celia Goldman, who was the co-chair of this interest group for three years until this past April. So Celia, thank you so much for your hard work and your contributions. I'd also like to welcome, and I'm thrilled to welcome, Freya Batens, who is one of the world's uh, renowned academics in this field, who is going to be co-chairing the interest group going forward. Um, it's a thrill to have her, and she's also my backup moderator today in case I have any tech issues. Finally, I need to mention that I uh, am an attorney advisor in the office of the state, or in, in the Department of State, in the office of the legal advisor. And so I need to say upfront that I'm appearing in my personal capacity and that any views I express are my own and are not necessarily the views of the Department of State or the US government. Okay, so now to introduce our topic and our illustrious panel. Um, as practitioners and academics, in the field of international courts and tribunals, we tend to focus on uh, the 20th century, and in particular, the, the latter half of the 20th century. So we look at things like the vast expansion of international arbitration. We look at institutions like the PCA, the PCIJ, the ICJ, ICSID, uh, criminal tribunals. But obviously, there is a vast history of interstate disputes, in particular, uh, before this period, and in particular, the late 18th century through the early 20th century. The United States was at the vanguard of the movement toward uh, peaceful interstate dispute resolution during this period. The substance of these claims in which the United States was involved is quite interesting, but what is equally fascinating, fascinating is the wide array of procedures adopted in these early cases. As you'll hear momentarily, the claims commission model was regularly used by the United States in these cases. Some other disputes were resolved through a complex multi-stage procedure. Some disputes were submitted to a foreign king to resolve. Uh, some awards were lengthy and detailed. Others lacked legal reasoning entirely. As many of the current means for dispute resolution are now being uh, debated, reconsidered, undergoing revision, we thought it might make sense to look back at these earlier models to see if there was something we might glean from those earlier cases. Now, we couldn't have asked for a better panel to look back with us, and I'll introduce them all in alphabetical order. So first, we have Amalia Kessler. Uh, professor Kessler is the Lewis Talbot and Nadine Hearn Shelton Professor of International Legal Studies at Stanford Law School and she is also the Associate Dean for Advanced Degree Programs there. She is a scholar of international and comparative legal history, among other things. Professor Kessler has chosen to focus her remarks today on the General Claims Commission, which is one of a series of commissions set up between the US and Mexico to resolve claims of nationals of one state against the other state. Next, we have Harold Coe. Professor Coe is the Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale Law School and is the former Dean of that school. He also served as the 22nd Legal Advisor to the Department of State. Professor Coe has picked the three J Treaty arbitrations, largely regarded as having kickstarted the modern era of interstate dispute resolution. The J Treaty arbitrations were established to resolve border claims, uh, creditor claims, and shipping disputes between the United States and Britain following the Revolutionary War. Our next speaker, again in alphabetical order, will be Natalie Reed. Ms. Reed is a partner in the International Disputes Group at Deba Boyce and Plimpton. Among her many professional activities, Ms. Reed is a former ASIL Executive Council member and is currently on the Board of Editors for the American Journal of International Law. <coughs> she also serves on the board for the London Court of International Arbitration. Ms. Reed will be addressing the Schufelt claim 
uh, which is a claim brought in diplomatic protection by the United States against the government of Guatemala to resolve an investment claim involving Chickal. And I had to look this up. The internet tells me that Chickal is, and this is a quote, the milky latex of the Sobadilla tree, which is used to make chewing gum. Finally, our fourth speaker is Jennifer Thornton. Ms. Thornton currently wears several hats, including uh, counsel at Errant Fox's international trade practice. She's also a lecturer at Columbia Law School. She previously served as senior policy advisor and counsel in the office of the US Trade Representative. And before that, she was uh, an attorney on the team that represents the United States in investment arbitration. Ms. Thornton has selected the Alabama claims brought by the United States against Britain for attacks against private shippers in the Atlantic during the Civil War. These attacks were carried out by the CSS Alabama, a Confederate ship that was manufactured in Britain despite Britain's claimed neutrality. So that is our introduction, and I'm gonna turn right away to our panelists. I'll start uh, with Harold. Harold, could you uh, talk about how and why the Jay Treaty arbitrations came about, including the political and the diplomatic context? Uh, thanks, David, and thank you for taking us back to this uh, fascinating history. Um, the Jay Treaty basically developed uh, to avoid another war, and um, it succeeded in doing so while also, as you say, kickstarting the modern generation of international arbitration. Um, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, about Hamilton. Um, it ends on a happy note, but what that doesn't tell you is that after the peace was signed, uh, with um, Great Britain and the United States, uh, the British largely uh, didn't carry out either in letter or spirit the Treaty of Peace. They still garrisoned posts on U.S. Fr uh, frontiers. Uh, American citizens were prevented from navigating the Great Lakes, and the Brits generally didn't make compensation to uh, for persons who had been carried away by the British fleet. At the same time, they were about to enter into an all-out war with France and started to commandeer U.S. ships and violate the neutral rights of Americans. This is obviously a very fragile moment for uh, the new American colonies, and particularly for President Roosevelt. And so uh, John Jay, who was the first chief justice, was dispatched to negotiate a treaty of amity, um, commerce and navigation with Lord Grenville in 1794, it became known as the Jay Treaty. And um, one of the moves that was made was the decision, as you say, to adopt these three commissions. Uh, the first was about the border of the San Croix River. Uh, the San Croix, there are several San Croix rivers in the United States. There's a famous one in Wisconsin, but this is the one up uh, in the northeast border between Maine and um, uh, Nova Scotia near the, the Allagash River, those of you who are canoe specialists. The second was about British debts, uh, which were owed because of activities before the war. And then the third were about maritime claims involving the 250 American ships and the 150 ships that were condemned. Now, the treaty was largely viewed as being extremely pro-British, and therefore it sparked huge domestic turmoil as another sellout of the new nation to the Brits. And the major attacks came from uh, the anti-federalists uh, like Jefferson, who were opposed to the treaty. And it was in US domestic politics, uh, incredibly unpopular treaty. Jay was actually hanged in effigy around the country. Uh, it was one of the most unpopular actions ever taken the Federalists, using their time-honored pamphlet style of defense, uh, undertook to circulate petitions to rally the people behind the treaty and behind President Wilson. Um, but uh, the cleverness of it turned out to be that Jay thought that um, if there was a basic treaty of peace negotiated favorable to the British government, that uh, some issues could be left to the law. And so this was the central innovation, the separation of politics from law, 
leaving the politics to be settled by treaty and then leaving the other issues to be settled by ongoing uh, arbitral disputes. And uh, at the same time, it envisioned that these arbitrations would be conducted through a combination of law and diplomacy. And so diplomacy never really completely left the picture as part of all three arbitrations. <laughs> I'll say more in a bit. Uh, one of the commissions was quite unsuccessful, the British Debts Commission, the Americans walked out. Another was partially successful, or depending on your definition, quite successful, namely the San Croix River boundary um, enunciation. And the Maritime Claims Commission was um, unusually successful and sparked other claims commissions going forward. Thank you, uh, Harold. I'd like to stick with um, the, I suppose, the foundations of some of these tribunals by, by turning to Amalia. Oh, actually, I should mention, uh, Harold said Hamilton ends on a happy note. We may have seen a different, a different play. Um, but, uh, but Amalia, the United States and Mexico have had an unusual relationship with claims commissions. Um, by my count, they've set up eight different claims commissions, or they set up eight different claims commissions leading up to the general claims commission that uh, you are focused on. So what was it about the relationship between the United States and Mexico that led the countries to engage this mechanism over and over? Let me just begin briefly by thanking you, uh, David, for uh, inviting me to, to join you. I'm a legal historian who's really focused on dispute resolution processes from a comparative and, and, and uh, primarily domestic perspective. So it's been a lot of fun for me to begin thinking more systematically about um, international arbitration as such. Um, so on your question, why, why US and Mexico uh, repeatedly uh, returned to the Claims Commission Mexican uh, uh, mechanism? Uh, a big part of the answer, I think, has to do with the nature of uh, the U.S.-Mexican relationship, which uh, in the first place led to a lot of claims repeatedly uh, emerging by citizens of each state against the other. So the very fact of proximity meant that there was a lot of border crossing, especially uh, given the U.S.'s increasingly expansive territorial uh, and economic ambitions. Right, so throughout the 19th century, um, the U.S. sought to augment and consolidate uh, continental control, uh, including through uh, obtaining Mexican territory. At the same time, uh, Mexico experienced repeated uh, political upheavals throughout the period, which intersected with U.S. ambitions as factions within Mexico seeking uh, domestic dominance strategically deployed efforts to secure U.S. recognition and support including by harnessing US intervention towards their own ends. So this mix of geographic proximity, US territorial and economic ambitions, and Mexican political instability is a kind of toxic brew that gives rise to numerous uh, individual claims related to among many other things, uh, investment, land title. Uh, and in the case of the 1923 General Claims Commission, the the post-revolutionary uh, Mexican nationalization of uh, land and mineral resources. Now, the fact that so many individual claims arose does not, of course, mean that um, these would be addressed by means of claims commissions. Uh, here, I think a number of factors were at play. I, I do think that, um, as, as Harold was just saying, the, the J Treaty Commissions are an important precedent uh, for the US, especially as it began thinking along the lines of the Monroe Doctrine that it was important to carve out the Western Hemisphere as an area of its own uh, distinctive influence. Uh, in addition, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that ended the US-Mexican War uh, in 1848 included an article specifying that the two countries would attempt to arbitrate to resolve future disagreements uh, before resorting to force. Um, there's of course good reason to doubt that such a soft commitment alone is enough to explain uh, the repeated use of this device and the treaty itself gave each country plenty of outs. So there were clearly reasons why both countries found it to be in their own national interest to continue using claims commissions. Uh, part of the answer here is um, I think that the, com uh, that the commissions were reciprocal in nature was important. Uh, they enabled citizens of either state to bring claims against the other. This was notably distinct, for example, from the claims commissions that Mexico ended up entering with a whole bunch of mostly European countries after the Mexican Revolution, which allowed only for the claims of individual Europeans against Mexico. Uh, 
So from the Mexican perspective, the reciprocal nature of the commission was one that at least in form respected its stature as a co-equal state and claimant. Um, so too, Mexico may have had an incentive to enter new uh, reciprocal claims commissions with the US in an effort to file claims that might offset unpaid prior debt from um, previous commissions. Uh, but we shouldn't be Pollyannish in, in assessing Mexico's incentives. The US could and did use its power uh, to force Mexico's hand, uh, for example, by making its recognition of the Obregón government uh, contingent on Mexico's agreement to establish the commission in 1923. As for the incentives of the US, it surely assumed that its dominant position vis-a-vis -vis Mexico would enable it to protect its own interest in these commissions. And once the practice of using commissions started, the very fact that so many claims repeatedly arose encouraged a tendency to roll these over from one commission uh, to the next one. Finally, as concerns the establishment of the 1923 commission in particular, I suspect that the late 19th century rise of Pan-Americanism and the concomitant effort to develop an American international law also played an important role um, although the theory and practice of American international law as developed in the US and in Latin American countries differed in important ways, arbitration was pretty much universally held to be one of its central tenets, which in turn pressed towards the use of arbitration to resolve the claims emerging after the Mexican Revolution. In theory, um, uh, these might have been taken, for example, to the, the permanent court of arbitration in, in The Hague, but um, given the effort to develop an American international law distinctive to the Western hemisphere, sticking with the more local tradition of claims commissions was appealing. That's great. That actually segues very nicely into my next question. I'd like to turn from foundations to procedure. So Natalie, um, by the time of the, of the Schufelt claim, which was uh, relatively close in time to the General Claims Commission, uh, the PCA was well established. The United States had already participated in three cases at the PCA. And yet for the Schufelt claim, the parties decided to pursue ad hoc arbitration instead of the PCA, and they chose as their arbitrator the Chief Justice for British Honduras. So why did the parties go in that direction rather than choosing the PCA, the, the new shiny model? So for uh, uh, after a bit of historical sleuthing, I think there are the, maybe three answers. Um, uh, the first has to do with the, the nature of the claim. So first of all, just to explain my background, um, uh, Dave mentioned that the arbitrator, the seat of the arbitration was British Honduras. Um, this is a map of the British Honduras at the time with the capital city, Belize. Um, of course, British Honduras later became the, the country that is now known as Belize. So with the nature of the claim, and I'll, I'll link this back, I promise, um, this, uh, unlike uh, a number of the, the matters that had been heard at the PCA in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, which as Dave mentioned, you know, the United States had not only participated in, in, in three by that time, but there had been a number more that had been referred. This was not uh, a series of claims that had been kind of consolidated and brought before. It was not an interstate dispute as such. It was a diplomatic protection case. Um, uh, Schufelt was an American citizen who was resident in Belize, British Honduras, um, and who had a claim against uh, the Guatemalan government um, that in many ways uh, very closely resembled precisely the kinds of claims that investors currently bring in investor state dispute uh, uh, settlement uh, procedures contemporaneously. Um, so the first is the nature of the claim, that this was different from a number of the cases that had previously been heard at the PCA. The second has to do with uh, fads and fashions. Um, the uh, case uh, dispute arose, kind of crystallized and really arose and was heard between 1928 and 1930. Um, by this point, uh, we were beginning to enter a period where the PCA saw very few arbitrations um, referred to it uh, uh, for resolution of this kind of dispute. Uh, the previous one, I think, had been in 1925, and the next one would not be until almost seven decades later. So that's kind of interesting. The third reason I think is the one that's most likely uh, to do with it. And uh, uh, for this, I am grateful to the fact that the State Department keeps such excellent historical records. For anybody who's interested, when you Google Schufelt claim, one of the uh, results 
uh, that you get is a link to the historical records retained of the telegrams back and forth between the minister to Guatemala, the title then for the uh, US diplomatic representative and folks back in Washington about how this claim came up, what the procedure was going to be, et cetera. And the short answer is nobody even thought about the PCA. It didn't come up, wasn't discussed. Um, the, the way in which the um, ultimate procedure was settled um, uh, for those, again, who are uh, students of uh, Caribbean and Western Hemisphere history, um, uh, British sorry, Guatemala at the time was very close to almost what Grenada was for the United States in the 1980s. Um, there had been uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, unrest. There had been a couple of uh, coups, changes of governments. Um, the United States had paid a great deal of attention uh, uh, to uh, Guatemala, so much so that by the late 1920s, it was referred to almost as a protectorate of the US. So one of the initial proposals had been actually for the US minister to Guatemala to be the arbitrator. Understandably, both he and Washington were not too pleased with that suggestion. Um, so, uh, uh, but both sides ultimately uh, uh, compromised. Um, Guatemala, Guatemala was focused on having something as close in physical distance as possible. Um, so something that would be in the region, um, ideally with a, a neutral arbitrator uh, and a neutral seat. And the United States was focused on having a streamlined procedure um, and low cost, something that uh, was not insignificant considering that the, um, the final agreement for the arbitration procedure was concluded within weeks of the uh, stock market crash in October 1929. Um, so the, what the parties ultimately settled on was the, the middle ground uh, that the dispute would be resolved um, uh, by an arbitration seated in Belize before the then chief justice for uh, the British Honduras. Fascinating. I wonder too, if maybe there's a link to what Professor Kessler said about the Monroe Doctrine also coming into play. Um, or there is. Uh, Jennifer, um, uh, in the Schufelt case, we talked about the, the Chief Justice of British Honduras being the arbitrator. A lot of these early cases featured very prominent uh, arbitrators as, as the appointed adjudicators. What can you tell us about the selection of the arbitrators for the Alabama claims and what effect that may have had on how the, uh, how the claims were resolved? Well, thank you very much, Dave, for this opportunity to address the storied Alabama claims arbitration. And it's, it's truly an honor to be on this panel with such a distinguished group of academics and practitioners. I think it's fair to say that the Alabama claims arbitration, which took place in 1871 and 72, uh, has a storied place in international arbitration for good reason. Uh, it was the first arbitration in the modern era in which two extremely powerful states, the United States and Great Britain, agreed to submit to arbitration the central political question of the day. Uh, it has a place in a story place in arbitration because it's the first arbitration, state to state arbitration, in which party appointed arbitrators were involved. It's often cited as an arbitration of significance because it's the first occasion in which a state was uh, instructed that consistency with domestic law was not a basis for avoiding liability under international law. And it's said to have galvanized peace movements on both sides of the Atlantic uh, who came to view arbitration as the preferred dispute resolution mechanism for investor state disputes. So the Alabama claims arbitration put arbitration as a mechanism for interstate dispute resolution on the map. Why we study this and whether it has any significance for our current conversations about the system of dispute settlement that prevails in international economic law is another question. And here I think I stand on, on the shoulders of some of the greatest legal minds of our era. Lord Bingham, Jan Paulson, Rusty Park, and the late great Johnny Veter have all written extensively on the US uh, or the Alabama claims arbitration. And they've come to very different conclusions about its relevance for us today. I, in fact, Johnny Veter in the first inaugural Charlie Brower lecture at this conference provided an incredibly compelling account of the Alabama claims arbitration. And from it, he concluded that we should not dispense with the system of party appointed arbitrators too lightly. Jan Paulson conducted his own equally insightful 
uh, study of the record of the case and came to the conclusion that the Alabama claims arbitration was essentially an arbitration in name only. And from it, we can derive very few uh, lessons of modern application. I think that Alabama claims arbitration is worth studying because uh, it points to different lessons that are applicable today. Lessons about the extent to which states should retain for themselves rather than delegate to arbitrators, the task of specifying the content of the international law rules which they, by which they'll be assessed, and lessons about the extent to which disputes involving strong political dimensions can ever be fully judicialized. So Dave did a very good job of setting the stage for the uh, Alabama claims arbitration. It was a dispute about the role that Great Britain played in the American Civil War. At base, Great Britain allowed the Confederate government to commission and outfit vessels in its ports and its waters, its territorial waters, which the Confederacy then used to effectively destroy the North's maritime industry. The CSS Alabama was one of these marauding vessels and it was the worst. It apparently destroyed 64 US flagships in its short two year tenure. As a result of this activity, the US in the middle of the Civil War demanded compensation. And they demanded compensation not just for the cost of the loss of the vessels and their cargo, but they also wanted reparations from Great Britain. Reparations for the cost and the damage that these vessels caused for the entire maritime shipping industry in the North and cost for the extent to which the activity of these vessels insofar as they move the war from the territory onto the high seas, the cost they imposed in prolonging the war. So this was an extremely important claim to the US government. Uh, they valued the indirect damages claim, the claim for reparations against the British government at $2 billion, which Johnny Veter uh, uh, has, has deduced equals about $30 trillion today. So this was a high stakes arbitration for both governments. It took them eight years to agree on the terms of the arbitration. And those terms were hammered out by a committee of joint commissioners. Uh, these joint commissioners memorialized the framework for the arbitration in the 1871 Treaty of Washington. And these commissioners were incredibly important people in both governments. On the American side, you have the US Secretary of State, an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, the incoming and outgoing US Attorney General. On the British side, uh, you had the Lord President of the Privy Council. Uh, you had the Chichley Professor of International Law. You had the leader of the opposition, the President of Canada. These were the leading statesmen of the day. These were the commissioners. And the central innovation here is that the commissioners in the treaty hammered out the rules of decision that the arbitrators would apply. And this was a very significant feature of this arbitration because what they did in that treaty was they specified what the law of neutrality actually was. They laid it out in three rules and Great Britain agreed to be bound by these rules, even though Great Britain didn't believe that those rules were consistent with the state of customary international law at the time. So this was a huge concession on the part of the British government, which was essential to the success of what later came in the form of the arbitration. In the treaty, they also set forth the framework for the tribunal, which was a tribunal of five arbitrators appointed by the Queen of England, the President of the United States, and three arbitrators who were appointed by uh, the King of Italy, the Emperor of Brazil, and the President of the Swiss Confederation. So that's what the tribunal ultimately looked like. But the tribu tribunal, in my judgment, would never have happened if the state parties, the disputing parties, hadn't agreed to the rules of decision and set them forth in the treaty, which the arbitrators then applied. Now, this was the result of a huge concession on the part of the British government. And I think when, when I come back to tell you a little bit more about the arbitration, I'll tell you about an equally central concession made by the American arbitrator in the case, which is uh, equally uh, the cornerstone of the arbitration's success. Hey, thank you. Um... Harold, um, 
well, Jennifer talked about the success of the Alabama claims. And you mentioned in, in your opening comment that the Jay Treaty was kind of a mixed bag, that one of the claims wasn't successful at all. Uh, you know, the others can be viewed as partially successful. Um, what factors went into those outcomes? Uh, well, the one that wasn't successful was the British Debt Commission. Uh, and I think the reason was pretty simple. It involved uh, claims uh, to British creditors um, that were largely incurred before the war. And the two alternatives were to have this settled by U.S. courts, which obviously the Brits were not interested in, or to have it done by an international commission, which ended up being five people. Uh, <clears throat> two of them were uh, British commissioners. And then there was a deadlock over the fifth, uh, the other two being Americans. And they picked another British person. Uh, and as a result, it was looking like it was going to go largely in favor of uh, British creditors and the Americans walked out. So I think that was the problem uh, there. The other two, though, um, the San Croix River Commission was largely a surveying exercise. Uh, in the Treaty of Amity, they had specified the river that was supposed to be the boundary, but there was some confusion as to exactly which river they were talking about. Uh, was it the Cobscook River or was it the uh, Magaguadovich River? I actually looked these things up on Google Maps today. Um, and uh, they needed to find the mouth and the source. They only had three commissioners and uh, they largely did surveying. They took testimony amazingly from members of Native American tribes. They commissioned a survey of the disputed region. They took testimony from John Adams. They reviewed the written deposition of John Jay and they heard additional proof. And they ended up issuing a declaration and a note in which they concluded that it was the, the Scudiac River uh, or Scudic River, which would be uh, the relevant boundary. But they only located a piece of it and then said this river actually divided, and so it was the northern direction, which constituted the rest of the boundary. And so it wasn't a full resolution of the issue. Uh, probably the most successful was the Maritime Claims Commission, which involved all the ships that had been seized, uh, American ships that had been seized by the Brits in violation of the neutrality. Um, here again, it was five commissioners. Again, they deadlocked and drew lots, and this time they picked an American. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I think what ended up happening was they decided that this was the way to resolve these issues. And what made the Claims Commission unusual was that it ended up awarding $11.65 to claimants, more than 530 awards. Uh, as well as 143,000 to Brits, and they were almost entirely paid. Um, it was the only commission that was directly concerned with issues of international law. At one point, there was a dispute about whether they could determine their own jurisdiction, and they said that they would. And it may have been the beginning of the third-party arbitration process that ripened into the Treaty of Ghent. Uh, I'd say this, that um, the reason why it's such an important uh, precedent is that instead of being a tribunal that decided by kings or one ecclesiastical figure, it was a collegial tribunal. Instead of just deciding based on equity, they issued a reasoned award based on the application of principles of international law. Uh, the Claims Commission went beyond the scope of just territory to decide an issue of monetary claims. And then maybe perhaps most important, it combined law and diplomacy. And so while there was uh, obviously a legal dimension, the fact that there were diplomatic conversations going on in the background made a big difference. Uh, this reminds me of the uh, most recent uh, compulsory conciliation between Timor-Leste and Australia about the uh, Greater Sunrise Field, which was the first compulsory conciliation done by the PCA. It also had the same quality of combining uh, diplomatic activity with legal activity. And I think you could arguably say that began there. Finally, let me just conclude with a joke that I heard in law school from the great Abe Chase. Uh, he said to me that the permanent court of arbitration is like the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, it's a complex 
oxymoron. The Holy Roman Empire was neither Holy Roman nor an empire. He said, the permanent court of arbitration isn't really permanent. It's not really a court because it has shifting membership, and it doesn't really do arbitrations because it does diplomacy as much as arbitrations. Ironically, as Dave Biggie well knows, now it is a strong, active, permanent court of arbitration, hearing lots of cases, both investor state and state to state. But in some ways, the tradition of being um, less of a court and more of a way in which diplomatic uh, and legal conversations can go on can end up resolving complex issues better under many circumstances. And this, this might well have been one of them. Thanks, Harold. Um, Amalia and Jennifer, I'm going to give you a, a joint question. Um, and our, our time is ticking on. So I could ask you to keep your answers relatively brief. But um, Amalia, we have the, the Claims Commission that you're addressing, the General Claims Commission. And, and Jennifer, you addressed the Alabama claims. Um, Alabama claims, very successful. General Claims Commission heard a small number of the cases that were submitted and then had to wrap it up and the claims were resolved diplomatically. So what kind of factors do you think went into those two disparate results? And, and Amalia, I'll start with you. Oh, Amalia, you're uh, on mute. Sorry. Um, so your question um, actually got me thinking about how we define success in a, a claims commission or a international arbitral tribunal. And clearly one important metric, uh, you know, key to your framing is that the commission manages to resolve all the claims before it and in a timely way. And uh, from that important perspective, I think it's obvious the, the Alabama claims was much more successful than the U.S. Mexican uh, General Claims Commission, which over a period of seven years resolved something like four to five percent uh, of the total claims. Um, so, just kind of on the question of why it was so uh, ineffective from that from that perspective, I think part of the answer has to do with the fact that the Alabama claims um, had to resolve a, a fairly defined, uh, predefined, and contained dispute uh, between the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, in contrast, the uh, U.S. Mexican Claims Commission was charged with resolving all claims of citizens of both Mexico and the U.S. that had arisen over an enormous amount of time, so the almost 60-year period from the last general claim settlement. As a result, no one actually knew at the time the commission was created um, the exact nature and scope of all the claims that might arise. Um, the sheer number of claims made it impossible for the two governments to actually review individual claims for merit, which ended up encouraging the filing of more claims. Um, the high number of claims um, surely led states to behave strategically, so the parties may have been um, anticipated that there was really no way the commission could resolve each and every claim, and so there was an incentive to file as many claims as possible in order to try to elevate the ultimate settlement value of a, of a general settlement. Um, another factor that added to the inability of the U.S.-Mexican Commission to resolve all the claims was the time spent constituting the commission from scratch, including uh, debating the procedures that would control. The, proce the procedures chosen themselves tended to slow things down. So as one example, there was a choice to allow oral argument with, without time limits. Uh, the tensions that emerged between the US and the Mexican commissioners were especially hard to mediate since there was only one uh, neutral commissioner working alongside these two. And, and um, Jennifer just, you know, I think was giving us a very helpful account of some of the reasons that the um, Alabama Claims Commission, once it started, um, started on, on much more um, uh, settled and, and, and uh, uh, footing. Um, last but not least, I'll just say briefly, one of the most interesting explanations I've read for the collapse of U.S.-Mexican Claims Commissions is um, suggested by a historian named Allison Powers in a fascinating new book, uh, Settlement Colonialism, that's forthcoming in a new Oxford legal history series that I'm co-editing. Power shows that more than a quarter of the claims filed by Mexico were actually denial of justice claims that arose from really horrific acts of racialized violence against migrant Mexican workers uh, in the US Southwest, often deployed as a tool of labor coercion. And she demonstrates how Mexican government lawyers pointed to these acts of violence and the failure of the US justice system to prosecute these 
as proof that the US failed to adhere to the standard of civilization. Making use of coverage in the popular press and diplomatic pressures, apparently the Mexican government was somewhat successful, uh, she argues, in shaming the US, ending up with some revol uh, resolutions of some of these claims that really went against US interests in the way the US didn't expect. So on her view, um, you know, the US had an incentive to pull the plug um, when uh, the claim by claim adjudication really started embarrassing uh, the US on the international stage. Um, so, uh, you know, that takes me to just one thought about how we think uh, retrospectively about um, uh, the nature of success. Um, if Powers is right, then the claims commissions may have actually played an important role in, in shaming the US, thereby contributing to Roosevelt's embrace of the good neighbor policy and the concomitant uh, commitment to, to non-intervention. So uh, from a kind of the, the, the backwards look of history, um, uh, metrics of success may, um, may vary from just, you know, can we efficiently get through all the claims? Thank you. Um, Jennifer, uh, views on the Alabama claims success or, or maybe lack of success, depending on our metric. Well, you know, I, I think it's interesting. Amalia talks about the lack of success of the U.S.-Mexican claims commissions, but uh, there is, there is a, a, it's, it, their decisions are still a resource that we use today. I think that's not true of the Alabama claims arbitration award. Um, it, it's characterized by a virtual dearth of legal reasoning. In my, it, from my perspective, the Alabama claims arbitration was such a success because of two tremendous concessions that were made, uh, both uh, for, um, at the onset by the British government uh, and the high commissioners who negotiated the rules of decision and set them forth very clearly in the treaty, which the arbitrators then applied. The concession was that Great Britain didn't think that those rules actually reflected the current state of customary international law but it agreed to be bound by them at the same time. Uh, during the course of the arbitration, the US proceeded with its claim for indirect losses or reparations to the outrage of the British government who thought that they had dispensed with this claim in the context of the high commission. And, and, and the concession that was made by the US government in the middle of the arbitration was the US appointed arbitrator uh, Charles Adams, who uh, was the grandson of the second president of the United States, the son of the sixth, uh, an incredibly prominent American, decided uh, on the authority, with the authority of the Secretary of State at the time, to effectively waive those claims. So the claim commission or, or the, the Alabama claims arbitration was successful in my judgment because the disputing parties didn't defer entirely to the arbitrators the resolution of the fundamental legal questions uh, about how their activity would be adjudged. Uh, it was also successful because the American arbitrator had the authority uh, and the political will to waive the central demand of the US government in the arbitration. So I don't think the arbitration would have been successful without either of these concessions. And as Harold notes, you know, these were not entirely legal concessions. They were concessions with very strong political and diplomatic dimensions. So in my opinion, the Alabama claims arbitration is worth studying because I think it tells us something about the kind of processes that we have to retain when we're charging arbitrators with resolving disputes with political components involving significant legitimate public welfare measures. Thank you, yes. I think a, a theme of a lot of the discussion today is the important link between continuing diplomacy and the judicial procedures we're talking about. Um, Natalie, uh, my last question for you, and then hopefully we'll have time for a question from the audience. Um, the Schufelt claim, obviously there's a parallel to modern investor state claims, although this was a diplomatic protection case. Um, can you talk a bit about the legal bases on which the, the claim was decided and how those may relate to modern ISDS cases? Sure. So the, the, the parallels are striking, not just in the underlying facts. Um, so, you know, again, as I mentioned before briefly, um, the, the claim was one that the United States espoused, but ultimately was one of an American citizen whose interest in a contract that had been concluded between the government of Guatemala 
and Guatemalan concessionaires, and that had then been ceded to him, um, was destroyed by uh, essentially an act of the Guatemalan legislature. So again, the, it, this will resonate very strongly with uh, practitioners and scholars of uh, international investment law. Um, uh, I would actually commend uh, for those who are interested, actually reading the award. One marked difference uh, between uh, the Schufelt claim and let's say contemporary practice is it is blessedly brief. Uh, <laughs> uh, the award itself is less than 20 pages and it gives you the background, the procedure, the reasoning and discusses the evidence. Um, if we talk about models uh, for, for, for contemporary practice, I would recommend it uh, to all <laughs> sitting and future arbitrators. Um, but broadly speaking, you know, sort of in reading through it um, beyond the facts, uh, the reasoning and the ultimate holdings, uh, again, bear striking parallels to um, uh, the kind of current and contemporary state of international investment law on a number of, you know, kind of critical issues. And I'll focus on three. Uh, first, uh, the arbitrator uh, had to squarely address um, uh, questions of international or domestic law. So it was the liability uh, of a host state, a matter of international law or domestic law, and how could uh, the claims be understood. Um, this related to uh, the source of the claim, so whether effectively whether Schufeld had a claim that could be espoused by the United States. Um, Guatemala argued that he did not as a matter of Guatemalan law, um, and the response from the arbitrator was, international law will not be bound by municipal law or by anything but natural justice. Um, and then proceeded to say that we're actually going to disregard the legal person. That so much didn't carry over in, in, into contemporary uh, practice. But the idea that a state could not use its domestic law to avoid what might be an international obligation, obviously a cornerstone of international, public international law and international investment law practice. Um, second, um, getting into a little bit more of the, uh, the, the granular details, um, the decision addressed the questions of estoppel which again, we see uh, frequently invoked in contemporary cases. Um, uh, the US had presented on behalf of Schufelt um, a, a, a two arguments. The first was that the underlying contract was valid um, uh, under Guatemalan law and should be, uh, should be enforced um, and had been recognized as such repeatedly by the legislature. Um, and in the alternative, uh, that even if uh, the legislature had not uh, uh, gone through all of the necessary procedures to recognize it, um, uh, uh, it had been recognized as valid um, as, as a matter of practice and performance. That having gotten all the benefits of the contract, Guatemala couldn't turn around um, and deny validity. Now the arbitrator didn't have to reach it uh, because he ultimately concluded that the contract was valid, but nevertheless went out of his way to say that there was no doubt that the contention regarding uh, estoppel was sound and in keeping with the principles of international law. Again, underscoring the, the overarching legal framework that he adopted, which was principles of international law and not domestic law. Um, and then finally, uh, picking up on uh, points that Jennifer has made, key question was damages. Um, uh, the underlying contract had called for um, payment of a lump sum upfront and then annual payments um, up to a certain point, and of course, continuing for the life of the contract. So uh, Schufeld had claimed not just for loss damages, but for future profits. Um, and the arbitrator, uh, again, this is a question we know arises frequently in modern ISDS cases. The arbitrator in Schufeld um, ultimately awarded uh, the US for the account of Mr. Schufeld, um, something close to a quarter million US dollars in gold coins. Uh, which in 1930 was not chump change, um, found that the lost profits were the direct fruit of the contract and may reasonably be supposed to have been in contemplation of the parties at the time, and therefore uh, uh, awarded not just uh, damnum emergens, but lucrum sessions going forward. Thank you. It's fascinating. Uh, if you ever want to read a, a really short arbitral decision, by the way, look at the San Juan Islands uh, arbitration. Uh, it's uh, essentially a paragraph. It just says the United States won. That's it. Uh, I, uh, we have a little bit of time left, so I want to move away from my questions, actually, and, and try to get to at least one or two of the questions that have been posed by the audience. Um, the first one I'm going to pick, and I apologize to, to those of you who submitted questions that I can't get to. Uh, somebody wrote in and said, uh, you said a bit regarding how these government choices were shopped or sold publicly. 
Could you say more regarding how you think these moments shaped the public view on international courts and tribunals? And I'll throw that open to everyone, um, but maybe, uh, I don't know, Harold, if you want to start. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, in a macro political picture, why do people why did disputing parties pick an arbitral process? Uh, it's because the balance of forces are not able to get to an equilibrium deal, um, but you can't reach the deal either, a complete deal before the deadline for making the, uh, the bargain comes about. So there is some unresolved question and uh, what fills the interstices is deal plus arbitral process. And so, in the Algiers Accords, it was the creation of Iran U.S. Claims Tribunal, which ended up functioning now for more than 30 years. Um, you know, Dayton, it was the Birchko arbitration, um, which is an issue that people know is going to be thorny and difficult uh, and that therefore ought to be allowed to play out in the zone of law. In the Treaty of uh, the Jay Treaty was a good example is that they were able to take these three issues that were hotly contested. The the river boundary, the British debts, and the maritime claims out of the public discussion and out of the political fight because they could say, hey, it's an arbitration. So I think that it's usually described as something that uh, relegates things to a zone of law where people don't understand it and it can be addressed by experts. I think, though, that um, what it means, though, is that politicians need to understand when a arbitral process will help them. And that's when they have more to gain by making a deal with this kind of process and where they're going to be a net plaintiff. And so they therefore think that they're likely to win more often than they're likely to lose. Uh, Natalie Reed mentioned Trump change. Well, we now have a new category, Trump change. <laughs> you know, look at his attack on the WTO dispute settlement process where the U.S. has been largely a winner. And uh, it's astonishing that he doesn't know these own statistics of uh, U.S. success uh, in deciding to trash that tribunal, because uh, without it, we're back to the exercise of trade threats and sanctions, et cetera. So this is a good example of how uh, someone can misunderstand the public value and diplomatic value of arbitral process in settling disputes, complex disputes going forward. Does anyone else want to address that question? Well, I have one more, and, and this one will fall naturally, I think, to Jennifer, but I, I'd love to, to hear from, uh, from Natalie or Amalia as well. Uh, the question is, um, claims commissions before Alabama claims were formed mostly by diplomats and or kings, and after were formed by lawyers. Can you please elaborate on this? It kind of reminds me of the, um, the dealing in virtue difference between the grand old men and the technocrats. Um, so why is it, you know, before we see sort of this reliance on diplomats and kings, and, and frankly, there's some of that afterward, but then we also start to see the emergence of lawyers as arbitrators or commissioners? Well, I, you know, I think with the Alabama claims arbitration, uh, both the commissioners and the arbitrators who were ultimately charged with resolving the dispute were distinguished politicians, statesmen, and lawyers all at the same time. Uh, and I think that's incredibly important because I think that the two conces concessions that were made by the, by the disputing parties that were central to the success of the arbitration could not have been made by neutral third party uh, uh, adjudicators, no matter how distinguished they are in their respective countries. Uh, there was buy-in for this process and there was buy-in at the highest levels of both governments. Uh, and what I see now is, uh, you know, we're reforming a system and not focusing, we're, we're talking about reforming a system uh, which has been accused as illegitimate, and we're not focusing enough on that issue. How do you create buy-in within the governments themselves for the process? Um, Natalie and Amalia, I wanted to turn to sort of one, in, in the very few minutes we have left, one general question for both of you, um, which is, how, what lessons might be drawn from, from these cases, either the ones that you focused on today or, or others for modern dispute resolution, maybe building on what Jennifer just said. Natalie, can we start with you? Um, so I guess picking up on the, the, the points that, that Jennifer just made, uh, if I had to think of maybe two lessons or observations uh, to be drawn. Um, the first is 
the continuing attraction in both the diplomatic sphere and uh, dispute resolution, and certainly where the two over, over overlap of models. Um, one of the things that was striking in the exchange of telegrams that led to uh, you know, the Schufeld arbitration uh, terms was uh, where each side came with you know, sort of their own respective views of what the arbitration should look like. One way that that was you know, to cut through was to refer to processes that had already been adopted in treaties for classic interstate uh, procedures. Um, and we know, of course, in the context of diplomatic uh, uh, discussions and negotiations, that being able to refer to things that had already happened will frequently um, provide comfort, confidence, and cover uh, for people who need uh, uh, to, um, to, to reach agreements. Um, the, the second, I suppose, is um, uh, the uh, evolution from, um, in part evolution and in part uh, a mix, of uh, ad hoc procedures into established and you know sort of well recognized, well accepted procedures. Um, they're continue at the time certainly as you know your first question to me noted, uh, Dave. You have a well established institution like the PCA, and yet parties still opted for ad hoc arbitration for a number of reasons. Um, that continues uh, uh, to be the case by and large um, uh, in terms of having uh, that range of dispute resolution options. But again, what we see is um, uh, where you can have either a, a system or a mechanism that takes account of the reasons that parties would opt for ad hoc procedures. Um, you know, a streamlined procedure, uh, lower costs, um, uh, ability to um, respond to domestic concerns or uh, outside stakeholders. Um, that's where, for example, we see a lot of challenge and discussion and debate about what the current shape of ISDS should look like. Um, so again, from the perspective of what does history teach us um, for, uh, for what contemporary practice could be, those continue to be, I think, um, uh, uh, helpful uh, uh, observations. Thank you. Amalia. Uh, I, I guess I'll just say very briefly, um, I, I've been thinking about uh, this a similar question in terms of the, the virtues of uh, the move towards pre-established, increasingly professionalized tribunals like ICSID versus uh, a, you know, an, an early reliance more exclusively on ad hoc tribunals. And I, I guess I've been thinking counterintuitively about the, the virtues of the um, ad hoc in terms of perhaps some degree of uh, local accountability and responsiveness. If you buy the powers argument I just gave about the way that um, there was a degree of accountability to domestic uh, constituencies um, and their own kind of public policy preferences that perhaps we see missing in an increasingly professionalized, uh, uh, say, ICSID process. Thank you. I think we actually have uh, three minutes if Harold or Jennifer want to jump in on the, the lessons we can learn for today question. Yeah, um, you know, one of my favorite movies is Jerry Maguire where Tom Cruise as the agent is, is seeming to be fighting with his client, Cuba Gooding Jr. And then, then the client says, uh, you think we're fighting, I think we're finally talking. <laughs> and uh, I think that is very relevant to what's going on. Um, David Biggie did a wonderful job as US agent in The Hague with regard to the Iran US Claims Tribunal. Here's a country with whom the United States has had hostile relations for 30 years. But what very few people realize is during that entire period, daily diplomacy was going on in The Hague about the claims tribunal, and that that could have expanded and could have uh, broadened out along with the, the uh, um, uh, nuclear discussions into a broader, more peaceful solution with Iran than where we're at right now. So I think, you know, sometimes when people think we're fighting, we're actually finally starting to talk, and uh, arbitration is one way to start that process. Okay, well, I think that's about it. I'm getting warnings from ASOL to, to wrap it up. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have much more to add. Our, our, this panel was great. I mean, exactly what I was hoping for and so much more. Um, I really appreciate all of the time and thought that our panelists have put into it. Uh, if we had an audience, I'm sure they'd all be applauding uh, and standing on their feet. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I appreciate your time. There's a lot to think about in terms of developing new processes going forward.
revising our existing processes, uh, maybe thinking about, um, as, as some have said, some stronger buy-in, um, a stronger parallel role for diplomacy instead of a reliance on purely adjudicative processes. Um, but I appreciate all of the food for thought and, and I hope that everyone out there in, in virtual ASOL land is uh, as appreciative as, as, as I am for, for your, your talk today. So thank you very much.